with you today. So we're talking about the uh, modern FileMaker revolution. I was just um, sort of throwing it out there to our group at Proofgeist and figure out just how modern this revolution is. And um, the question I asked was, you know, what was sort of this first thing that, you know, was really kicked off the modern FileMaker revolution? You know, was it a particular version? Was it a particular feature? I got some opinionated answers back from Ernest and Todd Geist. I don't know if anybody here has any idea of what they would consider was the first sort of modern FileMaker version that sort of was a game changer or if there was a feature that really kicked it off for them. Uh, yeah, re relationships and multiple tables in a file. Okay. Yeah, definitely the visual relationship graph was very nice. And then also um, loved it when they added the uh, the guidelines on the front because I think it dramatically improved uh, all the uh, UX, UI uh, features of FileMaker because before it was pretty much uh, a wasteland. And so I think that the quality <laughs> of the layouts kind of improved since that point. Right. And generally just uh, that, version seven. Uh, you know, so generally has, version seven. What was that, Mr. Blackwell? Just version, you know, version seven. It had, as as Beverly said, it had the multiple tables. It had the relationship okay. graph. It had the modern, then modern uh, authentication uh, system. Uh, it took a few versions to get some of the kinks out of it, but that seems to me to be where we turned the corner, and that would have been on March 9, 2004, when that was released. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree with him. I uh, was using FileMaker uh, when it was just kind of a bunch of files uh, related, and uh, had a big project come in, and I had to switch over to fourth dimension, which I won at a Mac world. So I learned all, all this relational database and arrays and all these different things. And then fire, and I hated the program. It was horrible programming in it. Uh, <laughs> to do a drop down list took hours until you finally figured out all the little machinations. And then found like you go, drop down list. Thank you. Uh, and so <laughs> I immediately switched things back to FileMaker 7 and 8 and stayed with it ever since. And I sort of dabbled and moved into a lot of web programming and different things. And FileMaker, as it moved along, kept doing interesting things and coming out with new great features. And so I always kept coming back to it. Uh, it's an amazing program. It's amazing what they're doing with it right now. I'm delighted. Yeah, you know, I use fourth dimension as well. Um, I think I started in 40 version 6.5 and I remember area list being a big pain in the butt back mm -hmm. then. <laughs> and I, I don't think it was until version eight when the original developer came back and actually he solved that problem. Mm. But yeah, yeah, it's like there were definitely there were things that were frustrating with FileMaker back then, and then there were things. I think it was FileMaker four was the current version when forty six point five came out. Mm -hmm. and there, there were definitely strengths and weaknesses to both. It's just to go something a little bit more recent. I would say insert from URL that script step. You weren't limited to sharing data via export with external systems. Okay, that's that's just that's kind of where I think of you know a more recent rev. Evolution, I guess, as far as what you're able to do and what you don't have to do inside FileMaker anymore, you can rely on those external systems that you now can communicate. Right, right. Yeah, you know, I was using, um, I believe it was FileMaker 4.1 as sort of my first big paid gig with Holiday Inn with their reservation system. And they had this really complex setup, but, but they were all Mac based. And what we were able to do is we were able to take the Oracle personal version that they had on every Mac desktop. And I was able to hook FileMaker into Oracle personal and, and pull that data in and then be able to push data out, out as well. And so it was like this really complex system, you know, which included like a screen scraper off of a mainframe terminal session. It was just all over the place. So yeah, it's interesting to hear all of the different answers. Um, there was one particular answer that both Ernest and Todd came up with. I kind of share their opinion as well. I, I agree, like FileMaker 7 was a game changer. 
I remember when it was released, actually, I remember before it was even released, when we saw some of the developer previews, there were a lot of people sort of blinking their eyes and scratching their heads, not really knowing what to do with this thing. And it probably took a few versions before people kind of figured it out. You know, some people could say, you know, like FileMaker 3, which had the first somewhat relational version, you still had to have multiple files. You know, it was no longer all just lookups between files anymore. Where we like to put the modern FileMaker revolution is squarely in FileMaker 16. And, you know, I was looking at a blog post on our website, and that blog post, you know, used a standard sort of evolution of man graphic, you know, going from a ape sort of, you know, going back to a fish crawling out of the ocean and going up to modern bipedal man. And I was thinking, you know, with version 16, it didn't really feel like a revolution or an evolution to me. It felt like a revolution because we got a number of things at once. You know, on the UI front, you know, we did have the modern um, UI surface in FileMaker 12. That was a big deal. And then FileMaker 16 made that a lot more usable. Um, it gave us things like different window styles. So we could finally have things like card windows. We didn't, you know, a lot of stuff where we had to do FileMakery things, we no longer had to do in terms of design surface. Really, FileMaker 16, I think there were a couple of features in tandem that really ushered us into this, into this new world. And, and here's what I would say about that. Really, FileMaker 16 was released a number of years ago. And since that time, we've had the pandemic. At Proof Guides, we've always been a remote working environment. Even though there are a few people down in Jacksonville with Ernest, most of us are scattered sort of around the globe. And we've been that way um, pretty much from the inception of Proof. And then when we joined with Geist, we added more locations around the, <laughs> the country and around the world. So I think what happened with the pandemic is that the rest of the world sort of had to realize and live that reality that we've been doing for a long time. So we felt fairly prepared for this. <laughs> as as the, the ability to sort of collaborate in companies changed, the way that we thought of our FileMaker systems had to change with it. And, you know, historically what we'd done is we created these large systems. Our FileMaker system was the business. It ran the business. It was essentially a uh, mini ERP for many of our clients or a big chunk of the operational system for, for a unit within an organization. And that really started to change. And that started to change not just with the pandemic, but just with the way that software was being de developed and delivered. And one of the things that has happened is that software has become a lot more responsive to the user's needs. You know, even as a lot of places, you know, I, I've heard that the pandemic is over. I haven't seen it myself, but but I hear that it's over and lots of people have gone back to work, but I think there still has been a profound change. I know a lot of people who are still doing sort of hybrid work, maybe going into the office once or twice a week. And that's made a big shift in the way that we have to conceptualize the systems that we build and how we deploy our solutions, um, how they're organized and really thinking about things like performance, because that was a huge thing. Before, we had the ability to just count on there being, you know, very fast LAN, servers in a closet somewhere, and everybody's hardwired, and we didn't really have to worry about latency or bandwidth. And now, with all of our remote workers, you know, that was the first thing that we, we started to hear from all of our users was, the system's slow, and the system is unusable, and it's like, well, well what's changed? And what's changed is that, you know, people are on maybe a good internet connection from home, maybe a spotty one, maybe they're trying to work off of a sketchy Wi-Fi connection somewhere in a cafe. All of those things have changed. And so the way that, that we've worked has changed. But also businesses have changed. They're no longer looking towards a single ERP to run their business. Um, now there are several applications that they're using to run their systems and they want those applications to be integrated with each other and to talk to each other. So because of that, um, we see this as a call to action, that if we're going to do modern development, those systems have to be designed in a, in a particular way. It's no longer about we build this monolithic system. It's now about how do we solve problems for people, where those people are, and using the tools that those people prefer to use, some of which will be our FileMaker systems, and some will be other systems that we need to integrate with. And this is really where we pinpoint the revolution, because it's not just changed what we can do with FileMaker for our users, but it's changed what we can do, period. 
as someone said earlier, we no longer have to do rely on imports and exports to get data out of other systems. We no longer have to have these sync routines that are happening at night. We no longer have to worry about do we have access to the server? Can we do updates, et cetera? You know, all of those things are changing. And our customers expect those changes to happen pretty much instantly. You know, when they make a request, it's no longer acceptable to say, yeah, we can get to that. And, you know, we anticipate that's going to take six or eight months of development. They want to see those sort of changes happening pretty quickly. And we think that the FileMaker platform, the Claris platform, is actually very well positioned to meet those changes. So there's two parts of the Claris platform that we have available now, and then we have additional parts that are coming online. So currently, we really focus on server and pro. What happens with most platforms, and we've used many platforms out there. My wife works for Smith College, and she had a system developed for her in Airtable. And the system, you know, kind of worked, but they were reliant on one developer. They weren't able to integrate with their ERP system at the school. Um, they weren't able to integrate with their CRM. Um, a lot of the data interchange between Airtable and their campus systems had to either be done manually or had to be done with imports and exports that had to be created by other people. And that's just not acceptable for that office. They need to have real-time access to those systems, and they want to see those changes reflected in their system. We really think that the modern FileMaker development platform really enables that to happen. And so there's a couple of things that we think of when we talk about the modern FileMaker revolution. One part of it is really a, it's a design focus in terms of how we think of designing our systems. So it's no longer just a concern about, you know, we have our FileMaker system, and the only thing we need to worry about is that that system works. We're now looking at like, how can we expose things within our FileMaker system? How can we expose APIs to give other systems access? How can we integrate with other systems? How can we integrate with Slack or other, or Microsoft Teams to be able to notify users with the tools that they're using when different things are happening in the system? So leveraging the Claris platform and leveraging also web technologies. So it's no longer just about coding in FileMaker and then connecting to another web application, but rather we think of it as the two things going hand to hand. They, these are all pieces of a, a larger puzzle. And some of the pieces are done in FileMaker. Some of the pieces are done in web. Um, you know, Todd Geist, I think, I'm trying to remember when it was. It was, I think, back around the release of 16, or maybe it was FileMaker 15 gave a presentation at DevCon called JavaScript is eating the world. And I think he was right because it seems to have eaten the world, which is actually great news because we now have the ability to integrate that JavaScript directly into our solutions. So when we think of a modern FileMaker solution, there's a number of things that we think about. The first thing is, is agile development. Um, with some of the monolithic systems that I personally have built in the past, one of the things that happens is that all of that knowledge is locked up in my head and it's difficult to develop or to extend by other users or other developers in our company because they don't know how all of the pieces fit together. And when you have the entire data model in your head and the entire application model in your head, you know, I could do it. I can go in there. I know which pieces to touch. I know which pieces not to touch. I know what, you know, if I, if I change this, this is going to impact that. But we really have to rethink how those solutions are developed. You know, we need to be able to develop pieces quickly. They need to be easily modifiable and easily extensible. Second thing is built for scale. When people started moving out, you know, away from a centralized workplace, when we started adding additional users into the system, we really needed to be able, these systems really needed to be able to scale up to meet the demand that the users had. We need to, these systems to be connected to in a larger network. And what that means is there's a large network of applications that a company uses in their, in their business operations. The Claris platform and this, this FileMaker solution that we develop need to be an integral part of that. It can no longer just be this, this FileMaker thing that's on the side. It has to be integrated into everything that the user is doing so that they don't see you know, their FileMaker application as just yet another thing that's, that's out there. You know, it's, it's part of a larger um, vision of, of how the company is operating. 
And then the other part of that is that these solutions need to be fast. And when you have large solutions, if you're relying on the relationship graph to couple everything together, and some people you may be familiar, um, one of the things that we, we sort of advocated early on is using the party model in development. But the problem with the party model, at least the way that we've implemented it, is that it's incredibly slow. It's a couple dozen tables. It's tons of TOs on the graph. And if you need to integrate that into your solution, well, then it's going to be a performance dog. So we really need to think of different ways of designing our solutions that will allow them to perform at the level that people expect, especially when they're in remote workforces. And so there's a number of things that we focus on and how to do that. The first thing is that our solutions have to be cloud first. And what we mean by that is we can't rely on the low latency, high network speeds of having a server sitting in a closet somewhere. That worked for a while when everybody was there in the office. Now that we have people who are working remotely, now that we've extended the workforce, that's no longer acceptable. So we need to make sure that these solutions can be de deployed cloud first. It doesn't matter what cloud that is. It could be Claris Cloud. It could be our own automatic sy server system. But it really needs to be able to perform well on the cloud to give, you know, fast performance to everybody, regardless of where they're located. The second part of that is that really the design has to be loosely coupled. You know, the days of having everything all on one graph just don't work anymore. Instead, what we like to think of is we want all of these little pieces that are somewhat coupled together. And the way that we do that is through a design approach where we use things like APIs um, in our development. And that's both in hitting other web APIs. So if we have an application we've developed um, in Next.js or, or React, that there are APIs that are exposed to FileMaker. And we also expose our FileMaker scripts as APIs to other applications. So that FileMaker applications can act as a first-class citizen on the web. We also try to um, approach our development using modern development practices. The big thing there is the ability to do development, staging, and deployment. Um, we really advocate for that three server model where you do all of your development, you push to a staging server, so you can do all of your integrated testing, which hopefully is automated to the extent possible. Because if you're trying to do testing and you're trying to do that testing just on what you think that you've changed, um, you're going to miss things. You're going to miss regressions. And so automating your testing and doing that on a staging platform, we think is essential to FileMaker development. And then being able to deploy that automatically using the data migration tool, which really was a game changer. I remember when I was working for Holiday Inn, and the first time I had to do an upgrade on the system, it was, I believe it was 830 megabytes or yeah, 830 megabytes of data, which doesn't seem like a lot today. But at the time, I had it was a dozen tables that had to be imported. It really was an overnight affair. And the reservation center had to go to a backup center to handle all of the call volume. And that's why they scheduled it for 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. to have this, this upgrade done. And of course, it actually took until 6 a.m. to actually get it done because it took so long. I really think the data migration tool has been a game changer there. Because now when we do deployments to production servers, it's taken what used to be hours and had to be done offline or had to be done off hours. And it's really made it so that we can schedule it and get it done in, in a matter of minutes. And then the last part is really integrating um, web technologies. So instead of trying to replicate design patterns that we see elsewhere in web apps using FileMaker gimmicks, and I, I, you know, I've been guilty of this myself many times, you know, trying to replicate a design pattern that I've seen on the web that FileMaker didn't really support. And so I would sort of, you know, move heaven and earth to try to get it to do that. And it took a lot of time and it was a lot of work. And now really just integrate the web technologies directly. The web viewer has the ability to run JavaScript now. And there's, there's no point really in and not doing it that way. I'm not going to go through the entire presentation. Um, I think actually Ernest has put this presentation, um, he's made this available elsewhere. But I think in terms of modern FileMaker development, 
the big thing for me was that FileMaker 16, I think, really changed the game. Um, insert from URL um, with curl access was a, a game changer in terms of integrating with other systems. You know, now FileMaker could actually talk to other systems. The different design improvements that they made meant that I could greatly reduce the amount of just nonsense <laughs> that I was doing in my, in my FileMaker development to try to replicate design patterns. And then the move to JSON, um, having native JSON, and, and we've had access to JSON before through various plugins, and some custom functions, but really having it native, I think sealed the deal on and ended the discussion about, you know, how should we be moving data around within FileMaker? There is no reason to use any other data encoding really other than JSON. And we use it extensively. We use it to pass data between our scripts. We use it to pass data to the web viewer. We use it to pass data to other applications. And we really think that learning and understanding JSON and using that it's really key to adopting, you know, sort of this modern approach to FileMaker development. So I'm going to stop there and open it up to discussion because I'm curious what other people think about in terms of whether you agree with us. Um, and I don't expect that necessarily everybody agrees, but I hope I made a compelling case that, that really FileMaker 16 was a revolutionary release. And it's really prepared us for developing solutions for the modern world. Yeah, I'll agree, but I think we had to have that jump to seven to be able to think in terms of the rest of the world because of the way that it was structured, that we had to think in terms of, we're not doing it all like this. We have to integrate, if you will, within itself. And that kind of opened the doors say, oh, hey, I can step outside of this as well. So 16 definitely was, a good game changer, but there was a lot of right. before that that kind of got us there. Sure. I mean, every, I think everything built off of the previous versions, you know, when we get variables, you know, and, and you know, there, there are a number of different steps there, but it, it seemed to me that most of the steps, aside from seven, were really incremental changes to the FileMaker platform. And that 16 really allowed us to move into the modern world where we could really, where, where FileMaker could act as a first-class citizen on the web. It's not just about being able to build better FileMaker, but rather being able to build applications that were not just FileMaker, um, being able to integrate with other applications better, being able to expose FileMaker to the web. So for example, using our auto product, we're able to accept webhooks into our FileMaker system. And that really was made possible, you know, with, with later versions of FileMaker. And again, you know, there were, there were ways of doing this. I remember, uh, I think it was Digital Fusion had a tool that made it easy to sort of work with, or easier, I should say, to work with like JavaScript and web viewers and FileMaker. But a lot of that, you know, one of the limitations of each of those things is that when you start to look at your FileMaker apps, there's, there's always a limitation. And when you have to rely on a plugin, then that automatically reduces how you can deploy this. You know, what, what kind of app can I have? How do I have to deploy that app? Can I do it on cloud? Can I do it, you know, and it, so can I do it on, can I do it on mobile? Um, all of those things where we're asking that question, as soon as you're incorporating plugins and it's like, well, now you're limited. And so I, I agree that, you know, there are a number of things that we could do before, but 16 really made it possible to do these things so that the FileMaker application could be just another application that people are using. It, it wasn't sort of off in its own walled garden. Well, I've done a, a lot of web FileMaker stuff going way back to, what was the original Claris web stuff that you could build little websites with uh, the language? It kind of came and went. They uh, stopped CDML. using CDML. Yeah, CDML, and then that was replaced by an external one that I built websites on for like Safeway and for different people. Uh, and then I worked on like web development, where there was exchanging of data from the FileMaker server about 
users and how much money they'd spent and birthday things, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so they would push data up from the FileMaker every night to the web, and then they would download everything. It was, so it wasn't live, but it was close. Uh, but they did it with extensions and they did it with, uh, you know, and it worked pretty hardy with what they were trying to do. But nowadays, you, it's all native. Having it all be native, and like you say, not having to worry about, can I get this right extension on everyone's computer? Are they set up the right way? Who needs to install it? Just using the native things that are available, Jason and, um, and Sir Earl, all these things are just amazing and wonderful. And it's so nice to have it all be native. Um, I found with a lot of FileMaker developers, hated getting to anything that was too programmy. They, you know, they liked it that it was easy to do, do quick and development. And then there were those that said, pish posh, I'm going on beyond this. I want to do really hardcore development, do all kinds of things. And FileMaker in the last several many iterations have just allowed that. You can just dive as deep as you want to be. JavaScript is a good example. It, the JavaScript isn't something you just sort of dive into one day and go, oh yeah, this is easy. It takes a little bit of beating your head on it and seeing how it work and how it fits in, but it's integrated. It's not an extension. It's not some other thing. So uh, that's why I continue to be delighted with FileMaker. It continues to throw these opportunities and challenges and stuff and makes it interesting. I, I think that was really key. I mean, making it native was a big deal for me. For a long time, for example, just in script parameter passing, for a long time, I resisted um, using any type of encoding because all of them required using some sort of custom function. They had their own esoteric syntax. There was no uniformity to it. It was like you adopted one, but you couldn't, you know, not everybody was using that one. Somebody else's system is using a different format. Once we got JSON, it was like, there's no reason to use anything other than JSON. There's, there's, there's just, different. you know, so I went from positional parameter passing to using JSON for parameter passing it makes my scripts easier to maintain and makes them easier to extend as well. You know, if I want another parameter in there, or if I want to switch up how my parameters are done, I can do that pretty easily. I don't have to like worry about all of the things that I'm going to break. As long as the script does what it was going to do before and it still does that, as long as it still honors the guarantee that it had, if you pass in these parameters, you're going to get back this result, then I'm fine. So I think that native usage um, of JSON in the, you know, in the application and all the other tools that have become native, I think those really matter. The other thing, though, I think that is loosely coupling things has been a real game changer for us. We are, we, what we use is a, a utility that we developed and it's available free for download from our website called SimpleQ. And it implements the pub sub pattern. And, and one of the things I like to focus on or, or to remind people is that none of this stuff is really new, but it's kind of new to FileMaker. You know, Amazon has their simple queue service. Redis has been around for a while, but we really haven't had a native implementation of some of these patterns in FileMaker before. And so simple queue was built in FileMaker to implement the pub sub pattern. And then that way we can have our applications talking to each other in a way that they don't have to be directly connected. I don't have to call your script directly. I can publish a message to simple queue and then your script can receive that message and do whatever it needs to do. And therefore it can be somewhat asynchronous. So when I publish my message to simple queue, I don't have to wait for your system to do something. I can keep on doing whatever I'm doing because I've already published that message and then your system can do what it needs to do. So that thing has been a huge game changer because it's both allowed, you know, us to receive webhooks from other systems and for FileMaker server to fire off an event in our system. And it's also allowed us to publish those, those types of things to other systems or publish them to other FileMaker systems or publish them to other web systems. So that idea of loosely coupling these things, it means that, you know, if you change something in your system, it doesn't break my system because my system isn't reliant on your system working for it to continue working. You know, either I'm, I'm sending a message out there and you process it or you don't process it. I don't know. And my system doesn't really care because <laughs> I'm going to continue moving. And also it's no longer, you know, one of the things I used to have to do is, you know, when I had this big education system, 
you would enroll a student and they would have to fire off like a whole bunch of events. And because they're all in FileMaker and because FileMaker scripts were all synchronous, that meant the act of enrolling the student meant that it had to run this script and it had to run this script and it had to run this script. And not only did it have to run all of those scripts, but it had to wait for all of those scripts. The user had to have permission to run all of those scripts, which meant the user, who is probably just you know some admissions associate in the admissions office, had to have permission to be in the financial system, had to have permission to be in the in the fundraising system, had to have permission to be in the dean system and in the academic system and in the athletic system, just so that she could run those scripts to do all of those all of those tasks that happen when a student's enrolled. And now all you do is you send a message to SimpleQ and say, this student was enrolled with this ID, and all of those other systems can manage their own tasks. The admissions user doesn't have to have access to those systems anymore, doesn't have to know anything about those systems. All they know is they've enrolled a student, and all of those other systems have gotten that message and do what they need to do. So I, th I, I think this is where we're coming from, is this idea that we're using web technologies, we're loosely coupling things, I'm going to um, throw out something controversial, which is because it's a complete, not a repudiation, but a reversal of something that I used to say back when I presented at DEF CON. I used to really focus on data modeling. I actually studied data modeling in school. I'm a big proponent of Lynn Silverstein. And, and I, I still believe those things are valuable resources. But one of the things that I didn't appreciate at the time was this idea of levels of implementation. And if you look at his data modeling books, he talks about levels of implementation. He talks about like level one, level two, level three. And as I started to think about it, I was like, well, was FileMaker 7 actually really necessary? I think it was you, right, Beverly, who said that it was the FileMaker 7 change that, that really changed the game? Uh, yeah, it was a huge change because yeah. it prepared us for being able to communicate within itself in a way that was very different that also opened our eyes then to say, well, now I can do the same thing outside of FileMaker. Right. And do you remember the, uh, I forget what they called it. Um, it wasn't called the data de database design report. It was called something else before that in FileMaker 6. Do you remember that utility style that they gave us? I think it was still called DDR, but I think it was. Was it still called DDR? But it was, but it, be, it became a FileMaker file. It was a FileMaker file, right? Yeah. Yes. Do you remember how that was structured? Uh, no, but I probably find <laughs> screenshots of it. <laughs> oh, I see. I do remember because I remember looking at it back then. And they did something interesting. They had, I think it was like, six or seven tables in that file. But this is, remember, this is FileMaker 6, so you could only have one table per file. But what they did is they just had one giant wide table, and then they had all the field names prefixed. So each record used a certain set of field in that table. So it was kind of interesting, but I've been thinking about that for a long time. I mean, obviously, I still remember it today, so, so I've been thinking about it. And I don't know that seven was necessary especially now that we have JSON. So I'm going to say something controversial. I don't think seven matters because now the way that I do my data modeling, I no longer need a table. I can have a table with just one field. And that field is a JSON blob and it has all the data I need. Because really when I think about, you know, when, when I heard this was happening in their studio, it was about the same time that I was also doing the same thing. I was starting to look at the data model. And I was starting to look at these deep relationship graphs that I created where there's like seven or eight hops. Anybody who's ever created a relationship graph that's got like seven, eight hops away, you go into find mode, you try to find one of those related fields, and then you leave for a couple of hours and you come back and then maybe it's still processing or, or maybe your system's hung up, you don't know. And that was a key problem that I needed to solve. And I started to think about the way that I've done this development. I was like, you know, actually, the table structure doesn't matter because as long as the data is there in some sort of regular format, so if that data is actually just a JSON object, then do I need tables and fields? Not really. So I'm not sure that 7 actually matters. I mean, back when 7 was released, it mattered a whole lot. Now that I have JSON, 
it doesn't really actually matter that much at all to me. Because I'm actually doing this in a system for MIT that, that we've developed, where what we're doing is we're just passing JSON objects. And, you know, we break out fields in the table still, but those are just for display purposes. We, we break out calculation fields and things like that so that we can fancify the display of that data rather than just, you know, throwing a JSON thing there. We could have done that with a JavaScript and a web viewer too. We do it with, you know, calculation fields. We could do it with a, a button object, anything that can throw formatted data on the layout. So at this point, like, I don't know. I don't really care so much about tables and fields anymore. And so when I heard that Claris was going to Mongo as the back end, I was like, well, that's perfect because that's pretty much what I'm doing already. You know, Corn, I've been thinking a lot about that exact issue also as it relates to data display and using global global variables essentially to assign mm -hmm. themselves based off of the the JSON object that gets passed in so that you can then display what you need to on the page without having you know, all those objects. One of the things I've been doing for a while is I've been reducing the number of global variables so that if I have a block that I'm going to display several different items, I create one mm -hmm. variable for that block so that it's one item that has to be rendered instead right. of the label and the variable, the label and the variable, the label, and then all of that, I can just yeah. do it yeah. right at one block to keep it nice and, and contained. So the other advantage that you get by using a global variable on your display is that you can send a script to the server, have it process it, return back your JSON, and have your variables yeah. assigned off of that JSON object that you get back, you have no mm -hmm. record locking. It's ridiculously stupid fast. And then you just right. have to build functions to be able to edit that data. You, you're you editing yeah. the variables again, right? And mm -hmm. just let that stuff flow. And they are, it's ridiculously fast. Yeah. And, and that's pretty much what... what the reason that we move to this approach, because we're just sending a big chunk of, of JSON back and forth to things. And the thing is that that's what you're doing with other applications too. I mean, for the most part, some of them are using XML for their APIs, but most of the REST APIs out there give you the option of receiving a chunk of JSON or sending a chunk of JSON. And so that's all our scripts do. Our, our scripts send chunks of JSON to each other. They send them out to web applications. They get them back through webhooks. It's all just JSON moving around. And there's no real need, you know, decompose that JSON into some sort of normalized data structure. Because oftentimes you don't even control all of the data anyway. You know, for our systems, our data is in, because we're using different systems, you know, we, we're using a payment processor. You know, we've got a, a website that's built using WordPress and other tools. We've got a CRM system that's somewhere else. So we don't, even have like a centralized place where we store all of our data. Now, you know, the data is stored in bits and pieces here and there. And what we do is we just, you know, we take the JSON chunks from each of those systems and we display them in our FileMaker system or we display them in our web app. And that's really how we approach it. You know, that, that FileMaker data is just yet another piece of data, yet another source of data or consumer of data or both. And we're no longer concerned about like, oh, well, how do we store this in FileMaker? Um, it's stored in JSON. And, and where FileMaker is the source of truth, you know, I, I remember Peter Nelson talked you, throughout this term, um, eventual consistency, which is something that, that you can do in Mongo. Um, and the, the basic idea is that, you know, you have this document. So like if we have a person, they have a phone number, we might we store that phone number inside of an array in that person object. But we might also decompose that down into, into you know, there's a phone object and a person object. And, and really all it is, is we kick off a message to SimpleQ that says, hey, we've updated the phone number for this person. Now go update that phone number in any other objects that might be using it. And that's the whole idea is that, you know, really the server is foremost in our systems now. 
because the servers where all of that activity is happening. And again, because we're not like editing FileMaker fields directly on a layout, we don't have all of that record locking that we deal with. You know, we throw up an edit form for the user, the user edits the data, we get that back as JSON, we store it as JSON, and then we kick off a message in simple queue saying, hey, everybody, this data's changed. I think one of the things that what you're talking about, Corn, is it's almost like we now have to be more mindful about how we're using FileMaker. So like, can does mm -hmm. the data model matter? Sometimes when it's your data storage, Sometimes. right? Does it matter when it's yep. your tool for UI UX? Not as much, right? Like the way that you might build it is different because you're focused on a different problem. And I think gone are the days where FileMaker was, where we were, I mean, I remember the days of trying to build everything in FileMaker, everything, right? Yeah. Because there wasn't anything yep. to integrate with easily, right? Or it was like, my best bet is maybe a plugin if I can find it and if I can afford it, right? Or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, I, I, on most of my projects, I do, I do, well, Barbara will attest that I do some business analysis on projects. And like, I don't feel stuck very often, right? Like before I used to always say like, FileMaker can do right. anything. But that was a lot of me rebuilding something, right? Or, or trying to reinvent yep. something that some other system did. That's not what I do anymore, right? Now the question is, yeah, I know we can do it, but the question is, what are we going to use? And sometimes the answer is just FileMaker, but a lot of the times it's like, I love the idea that FileMaker stores the data, but let's use this awesome web technology to do some solid UI UX, right? Where the mm -hmm. user gets a really distinct experience of dragging and dropping and moving things around that feels very natural, but FileMaker can still hold the data and, yeah. and vice versa, right? There are other cases where FileMaker just holds the data because we want to connect to Tableau and FileMaker has been the place of truth in the past, right? So anyway, so I, I think right. that it, it can feel like a lot of extra homework, but at the same time, it feels freeing that I have choices, I don't, you know, and I get to use right. the, the best tools and, and I can't, you know, if, if we went back, like imagine if Slack had been our file maker. Like, can you imagine trying to do everything through Slack? That's that's crazy, right? <laughs> and I think that's what we're doing is right. like we get to now think of a file maker as this little as this pretty strong puzzle piece, but we've got a lot of other good pieces and they talk to each other. It's not like you're having to pick and choose one over the other. You're just figuring out when you'll be using it and why. Right. And I think really the big thing is is focusing on and I'll, and I'll go back to the um to the slides earlier really focusing on what is it that we're trying to solve? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the user experience better. And the user experience is more than just the pixels that they see on the screen. The user experience includes everything. Can they connect to the system when they are remote, when they're you know, working off of a phone connection? You know, How does that performance feel? Does it do what they need it to do? Does it do it the way that they expect it to do? And sometimes the answer is yes, and we can do that in FileMaker. And sometimes the answer is yes, we have to incorporate this other tool. But it's no longer about, well, I, you know, and, and I remember answering those things like, yeah, we can do that. You know, the answer is always like, yes, but it's not going to be fast or it's not going to be exactly the sort of UI that you want, or it's not going to be whatever the limitation was, because, you know, the, the answer was yes but I'm using FileMaker and I have to work within FileMaker's limitations. And I think a lot of those limitations have just gone away. And so now you're no longer focused on solving these problems that are difficult for FileMaker. It's really about how many of the users' problems can we tackle and what are the tools that we need to do to tackle them. Can I get an amen? <laughs> yeah, I looked up in the XML book, it was database design reports and they had a version that was XML and a version that was a database. And it was 5.5 five that mm -hmm. it started. It was 5.5, five, right? That it started? Yeah, yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember who built that. It might have been Heiser, um, but I might be wrong on that. I, I don't recall. But it, it really opened my eyes to the idea that tables are just suggestions. <laughs> how, you know, how we use them, um, if you use it to store actual fields, if you use it to store a big JSON object, it's up to you. It's it's whatever, whatever's going to solve the problem and not create more problems for you. So Martha and I have been working together. We're dipping our toe in this whole idea of just storing a JSON object. Corn, I'll be honest with you. And I hear Jihad's voice always be thinking JSON. Um, the two things that occur to me in all of this stuff. First of all, it's, is there a bit of a challenge when it comes to reporting 
or what challenges do you see when you come to reporting? If you're just storing a JSON object and then you have to report, take a simple thing. And, and the whole idea of a, a JSON object really hit me home when Todd was teaching me Ledger Link because it was like yeah. all you were doing is passing around JSON back and forth. So an invoice and its lines as an array in one big object, and you had to report a total of all invoices. Now, if, okay. Okay. So in your world, if you wanted to go to the extreme, just play along. <laughs> you have an invoice. <laughs> object stored in a field invoice underscore yep. json and i had to report total yep. invoices what would you do if you wanted to take the model of i don't really need a data model so there's a lot of things you can do for example let's say you have that invoice object and the line items are just an array inside of that object right yep. that's the, the premise of the of the puzzle here right if i can create a calculation field to total those things up I can carry a calculation field using the while statement, which is one of my favorite functions now, using while to just take that array and total all of those things up. And now that is sitting there available. I can create a new JSON object if I want, or I can just have that sitting in a calculation field. Whoops. Just lost everything. It's all fine. It's just my water bottle. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, it's just a water bottle, but it made a lot of noise. Sorry. Okay. Um, you know, the only thing that would have made that better is if there was a cat screeching at the end. Oh, no, no, no. That was the water bottle skittering <laughs> across the room. So and, you would add schema. And, uh, you would add schema. Yeah, but, but, but the schema is Permanent not about schema? Okay, data that's just, storage. That's just a one way off the top of your head. Another thing is? That's, that's just one way. Yeah, but it's not about data storage. Mm. It's really about, you know, you, you do what you need to do. To make it possible, so I know we so keep coming it really to you depends. guys with the def give us the definitive answer, and we never well, get the definitive it, yeah, answer. But, well, Barb, you've also no got JSON. tables, which are that's a great way to build reports, right? You've got JS tables, and you can do it that way. There are plenty of JSON or JavaScript tools that are already out there that are very, very robust. Yeah, that can build printable reports. Yeah off of a JSON object. True, they want a JSON object, so why are you untransforming it just to transform it back? Right. I, mm -hmm. I, I know, I, I hear you. Where I'm kind of stuck right now is where you've got, uh, uh, you know, your JSON is stored, but it's it's 10,000 invoices and you want customer A's invoice to total up. Well, if those are all records as JSON, it's fine. But how do you gather up those then to process? And um, it's temporary storage, yeah, into a variable or whatever. But um, it still seems like we're missing something that would be really cool if we could combine all the JSON as a chunk to be able to analyze it. Yeah. And, and there's a couple of answers to that. Um, one is that, you know, one of the things that we do sometimes is we, you know, you break out some key fields, for example. So I've got my invoice and I might pull out customer ID as a field so that I can search on just that value. The other thing that you can do is if, if searching on that value is not important, the JavaScript libraries out there, um, I have not yet found a problem where somebody hasn't already written the JavaScript function for it. <laughs> and they're wicked fast and they're wicked fast like you you know the, the slow part is you is just pushing this huge json object to the function and then the function's just done you know and then you get the answer back so i've been amazed at how many javascript libraries are out there and just how fast they operate it, it's it's so different than the experience in thumbmaker that sometimes you think something's wrong because there's no way it could be done that quickly and so that's that's really been the answer for me is that yeah if if there's nothing in FileMaker to do it like is it easy to do in FileMaker if so yeah maybe I'll do it in FileMaker if it's not easy to do in FileMaker and quick to do in FileMaker and like if it doesn't actually compute quickly enough then I'm going to look for a, a JavaScript solution there because I can I know 
I can compose the JSON, I can give it to the JavaScript function, and then I can get it back much faster than I could if I were trying to do all of that in FileMaker. And when I hear the thing we're missing is passing off something off to JavaScript without having the need of a web viewer. That's what I hear. Um, yes, yes and no. I mean, you don't need the web viewer necessarily. You can, you know, a lot, it depends on the JavaScript library. So some of them, if they're written like a library, some of them you can, um, you can host it yourself. You can create lambdas with it. You know, so if you create a lambda, then you just have to hit a URL. Right. You know, typically okay. with a, you know, okay. you hit a post to that URL, you get the result back into your FileMaker. Again, that's the insert from URL step using the curl functions. Well, so that goes back to the original saying where um, the answer was always yes, but to me, the answer but, wasn't yeah. yes until I walked away from a client meeting, thought about exactly how I was going to do it. <laughs> Could I do <laughs> it? But it was never a sure thing. Could I do it? Because right. we had such a closed world. I, yep. That pressure is gone. I, I do feel like the answer is yes. It's like, well, what am I going to use to do this? Is it going yep. to be JavaScript? Is it is it going to be some API somewhere? So that is what's changed dramatically to I think for me from I, I guess I would I would say sixteen because that opened my world to APIs. Yep. Yeah. Well, I I sort of got to the point some point last year that I realized that as a FileMaker developer going forward. I need to be, this is going to sound counterintuitive, less of a FileMaker developer and more of someone that could take and know about how to connect all the differing parts and pieces of mm -hmm. things that are already out there on the web and combine them in the best way that made sense for whoever needed to access or use that data. So, you know, maybe it's, Maybe it's F embedder forms, or maybe it's you know pushing to the client website that allows the creation of you know how to get in and how to a customer can see or update their information versus them logging into WebDirect, which we all know is ridiculously slow, right? Right. Versus yeah. just knowing everything about every single function in FileMaker and being an expert on those things. Yeah, that's going to get you a long way. Don't get me wrong. But to take the solutions to the next level, I think it's really going to get to the point where you need to learn and understand how to connect different things to build what the client wants. I, I really think that's the heart of our sort of our modern file maker revolution sort of manifesto is expanding the world beyond just FileMaker, looking at all of the possible things that we can integrate FileMaker into. And that's really why we're, we're still bullish on FileMaker, um, you know, as a platform, because, you know, especially as they released the studio product, which I've been amazed that, you know, it was a really slow start, but now they seem to have really caught some sort of cadence going there. And the product has really improved a lot just in the past few um, showings that they've done. But it's, it's really what's made us bullish on FileMaker. Like FileMaker can be the glue, you know, between your FileMaker system, as well as between these other systems that are not FileMaker, whether you built them yourself, like in JavaScript or something else, or if you're integrating with another system, you know, FileMaker really can be that glue and can really assemble all of those pieces together. I, I liken it to building with Lego. Because that's that's how I like to 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 design things and to build things. It's like I'm going to build this piece. I'm going to build this piece. I'm going to build this piece, and they're all going to click together. Somebody and the reason needs, that they all click okay. together, with somebody with needs that, to propose that as FileMaker as Claris's new logo for FileMaker is a red Lego block. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really what it should be. Um, and I think JSON is sort of that standardization of this is these Legos are all going to fit together because they're all talking the same language. You've got those knockoff Legos that don't really fit together well. You know, that's when somebody's using their own sort of custom <laughs> custom encoding or whatever. They're like, oh, I'm going to do it this, this fancy way because it's the XML RPC version, I guess. Um, have we, have I, we I really, found a way to get style like bold and underlined? 
in the JSON? I mean, you can do that. You can, yeah, you can embed the HTML. You know, there are functions in okay. FileMaker okay. to to do that. What is it? There's um, Get a CSS, I believe, is yeah. one of them. So, so the so, JSON contained HTML. Okay, got it. Yeah, you you can have the JSON contain all of that if you want. It's it's an interesting thing. I haven't really dealt with that much lately because really styles kind of annoy me. <laughs> The, you know, the, and to be honest, the only time that I've really dealt with stylized documents is in our education solutions where teachers are writing like narrative reports on the students. And so they want all of those styles in there, especially the English teachers who get mad at you if they don't have their underlines and italicized and bolds preserved. And I do get at CSS there. I've created custom functions that will go back and forth between CSS styles and FileMaker styles. and. And then they paste in a Word document that just blows the whole thing up. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but um, you know, otherwise, yeah, there are ways that if, if that's what's important, there are ways to do it. And, and JSON just handles it. I mean, again, JSON is, is JavaScript. It's on the web. It's just the standard way that data is passed using JavaScript, which originated in web browsers. So, so of course, well, it handles styles because it can, it can handle all of that. Another piece to consider with this with this idea is raise your hand if you're not developing in a legacy system. <laughs> oh, wait. so what that what it does is it allows you to build. What is the thing that takes one of, is absolutely one of the longest things to do in FileMaker, of course, is build the layouts, right? That always mm -hmm. takes longer, but not the having the right data model and the structure and everything right isn't important, but by having it as JSON and using that JSON as essentially an, an extrapolated layer, now you focus almost solely on the interface, which cuts your development time down. And if you're using something where you're using global variables and you're not displaying things on, you know, except for editing, it makes that very simple. And it, it makes it easy to move a legacy system into a more modern system because then all you got to do is go grab your data and package it up as a JSON object and pull it into your new table and you're done. You don't have to spend a horrible amount of time, file, export, import, you're not doing that. And I tell you, one of the things that I built, we haven't released this. I don't know if it'll ever see the light of day outside of the customer that's using it, was a forms editor for doing just that. So whenever they need to modify data, they call a script with a JSON payload. That script, as part of my forms editor, loads up a form, which is just a FileMaker layout with a bunch of global fields on it. They edit the data in those global fields. They click save, package that back up as JSON, sends it back so it can be stored as the object. It's very simple, very lightweight. Um, and it really makes it so that I, again, we don't have record locking because they're not editing the data directly on the, on the layout. We have a lot of flexibility. You know, if we want to just use FileMaker fields, we can create calculation fields that are looking at that JSON object and just breaking it out into individual things it doesn't really matter. Like these questions about like, do I use fields? Do I use global fields? Do I do this? Do I, they stop mattering. <laughs> the only thing that matters is, are we solving the customer's problem or not? And once we can switch to that, then we have customers that are actually, you know, giving us repeat work because we solved their problems, because we haven't run into like, well, yes, we solved this problem, but it's going to be dog slow. Or yes, we solved this problem, but does, you know, it's, it's it's tricky, it's complicated, you know, you, you're going to have to spend some time studying how to use this and, or yes, we solved this problem, but you can't actually do it, you know, your, your user who's remote, they can't do it because, you know, they're not going to be able to do this, or they're using an iPad and, oh, so sorry, you can't put a plug in on the iPad, so they can't do that. All of those things no longer matter. It's really about, you know, how do we solve this problem? Do we solve it directly in FileMaker? Do we solve it with FileMaker plus something else? Do we solve it with, you know, outside of FileMaker and then FileMaker is integrating that in? 
using multiple tools. And, okay. and server, FileMaker Server is the backbone of all of that because a lot of that processing is happening on server. And another thing, so most of you don't know this, my background is actually in IT and networking. That's how I started as a, as a guy back in the day. And I taught computer network engineering for a couple of years. Have any of you ever taken a copy of Wireshark and thrown it at FileMaker? <laughs> it is incredibly chatty. It is very, very, very chatty. A lot of the latency and the speed problems that you see come from FileMaker just doing what it is designed to do, talking back and forth, updating caches, all of that stuff. A lot of that stuff goes away mm -hmm. when you're displaying things as a JSON object and variables where you're not doing that record locking because what comes with that record locking is any change you make is then pushed out to all the other FileMaker clients that have that record in yep. their cache, right? And so you kill that. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why you get that incredible speed boost on the UI at the UI level. I, one of the reasons that I'm I'm so bullish about FileMaker generally, and it's true for, for the company, I think, as a whole, is that FileMaker allows for different degrees of success depending on a bunch of different factors, right? So like FileMaker can be slow for one client, but can be just fine enough for another, right? And so there's there are so many different ways that you can implement to anything that you can tailor. I mean, this is why we we don't build the same solution twice, right? Because sometimes we take the exact, what feels like the exact same problem, but we implement it in different ways because different clients need different things. They have different scenarios. They have different expectations. They have different design re requirements, whatever it might be. And so sometimes straight out, just FileMaker and Fields is totally great and fine. And other times it's not enough and that's okay too. And that's totally an acceptable <laughs> answer to the problem. So again, back to what Corn was saying, right? It's what problem are we trying to solve and what's the best tool to solve that problem now? And are, is it the same way we're gonna solve it in three years or even two years or even six months? Maybe not, but is it gonna solve it now? And can we deliver something? Awesome. And then can we come back and revisit it and potentially change it? Totally. FileMaker gives us that freedom that I think a lot of other software doesn't. De designing to be flexible is a, a big part of it. If we don't lock down, it has to be this, this, this. Right. But you know exactly the way that they talked about, then you can go back to it later and say, oh, <laughs> this would be easy to add something. Yeah, FileMaker has done so much with where it is. I just finished a big project where I um, people were on FileMaker 12 and they had <laughs> a, a data file that was 35 gigs. And I got to tell the story. And they had it on a server that had been running for 650 days because they were afraid to restart it. So over <laughs> a period of several weeks, all I did was very gingerly move it to Claris Web and made it really stable. And they're doing exactly the same thing in FileMaker 12 stuff. And then they go, what do you think we should do next? And I go, <laughs> where do I start? <laughs> you know? Well, let's see, we have like uh, 10 fields that are like uh, business one, business two, business three, business four, a bunch of repeating fields, all kinds of this sort of ancient stuff. Yeah. And you go, where do I start with this? And, you know, what I see in happening things like that is you have these old files and you do these things, you happen to come back to them where you encounter one like this, it all gets greatly simplified. Instead of 400 fields, you suddenly have 80 or 90. You use variables, you use all these things that's greatly simplified because FileMaker now right. allows for that where it didn't before. So interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know if we have any clients on old versions of FileMaker. I would say that for any project I'm working on, they're going to have FileMaker 16 at a minimum, or else I'm going to tell them maybe look for a different developer. You know, and they should be open to, if possible, getting up to FileMaker 19. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, 19 is released. I, I think a lot of 19 has been evolutionary rather than revolutionary, but still, you know, just, I don't think personally, and I, I, I feel like Todd and Ernest share the same attitude, 
not interested in people who aren't willing to invest to make themselves successful. And if you're running like an old version of FileMaker, if, if you're really worried about, you know, that server crashing, then yeah, let's, let's create a plan so we can move you forward. And one of the ways that we do that is be, by loosely coupling things, we just create a whole new file, you know, create some relationships over to their existing system and start really designing things to, to start to break these things into pieces. And that works. I mean, you know, a lot of what I was focused on early on in my development was, you know, things like separation model or in tier development, you know, having, you know, using MVC patterns within FileMaker, all of those things were super important. And I think all of those things are really just coming together. I'm not dogmatic about any one particular design, but I think just making sure that things are loose and flexible gives me the ability to use any tool that I want. It doesn't paint me in the corner. Like if I decided, well, you know, if I'm going to start, you're going to have to use the party model. Well, that's going to be a non-starter for a lot of systems. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be long, painful, and they're not really going to gain any benefit from using the party model. The only benefit there is I get to say we're using the party model. You know, that's, that's not a benefit for the, for the customer. Whereas if I can make their system so it's more reliable, so that they don't have to worry about the server going down, if I can do something like, you know, put auto in, and, and unfortunately, auto is not going to work on FileMaker Server 12. You know, it's going to require Server 18 or later. There's an old version of auto that kind of works on Server 17, but it's somewhat limited. But if I can put auto on that server, then I can set up another server, a staging server. It doesn't even have to be at their location. It can be out in the cloud. Then I can start doing things, you know, because I can start doing dev on their system. I can start doing testing on their system on the staging server. And then they can start to see the actual improvements that are happening and it's not live on their development server. I'm doing all of this work offline on another server where they can see the benefits and then they can, they can say, yes, we like that, let's go. And then we can deploy, you know, we can easily say, okay, let's take your data, let's push it over here. Let's take this new version. Let's, let's get them all set up together. We've, we've tested that on staging, we've approved it. Now let's, push it to the, you know, we deploy it to production and now they're on a whole new system, you know, in a modern version of FileMaker that where everything is working and everything has been tested. And I think that's key because if you're not doing that, then you're just sort of guessing and hoping and praying that nothing goes wrong. And that's no way to run a business. <laughs> and you'd be lucky not how if you do detect what goes wrong quickly, because then there's the, things that have gone wrong and you didn't even realize it months down the line. I, I mm -hmm. yeah, it's just two things. I mean, obviously, because we work together, but I can't imagine working on such an, an old, quite an old version of FileMaker. And I couldn't imagine working without a dead prod environment. Well, when yeah. I have to, my anxiety just goes so high. <laughs> I, I'm just so not used to it anymore. I'm so used to being able to freely dev and create data and all like that shit. It'd be curious to know how many of you are still working in production environments directly. A lot of you? Yeah. I am. I don't want to be. And it's I a trust huge it. limitation. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I agree. And I, it, I absolutely hate it. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it just to me, it's a question why, especially with the, the the tooling that we have out there now. That, so it's not like, oh, okay, well now I'm going to have to go back to the world of import hell. You know, we don't have that anymore. All right. Oh. I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say auto has just made my life so much easier there. Oh. Um, just just automating all of that. I don't I don't even think about it anymore. It's just like, oh yeah, I'm going to. And the other thing that you know, when we hooked up with um, with guys, some of the clients that we have, we can't actually see their data. We're not, you know, that data is sensitive or secret or top secret, and you can't just leave that lying around on the floor. So one of the things that that sort of environment does, it allows you to have a dev server and your developers aren't working with the data. And then you have a production server that you deploy to. And so the developers, their credentials, don't have to be, you know, their credentials can be in the development file, but not in the production version. So, you know, all of that stuff gets stripped out. All of the data is just test data. 
which so when it's pushed to production, they never actually see the real live data. So it really, you know, for a lot of the clients where, you know, they're concerned about data access, data breaches, data leakage, I think that's huge. I, I, I don't know why or how we've done it before. I mean, it, it really makes FileMaker an option now. I mean, we are working with some of these organizations and, and government institutions where they have really sensitive data. And the only way that that's possible is using something like auto and using this multi-server de development pattern where we have a development server, a, a staging server, and a, and a production server so that the developers never have access to that data. And I think once you once you adopt that, it's like, oh, well, I can use this with everyone. They don't have to be a, you know, a government installation. It can just be a mom and pop shop that has me developing something. You can still use that that pattern because it's just going to make your life much easier than if you make them. And I've made mistakes. I, you know, I had one time, I think I accidentally changed the field to unstored and there were 38 million records in that table. And that was not a good day for anybody. <laughs> it, it really comes down to who your clients are and what their needs are, yeah. what their budgets are. I mean, there's a million variables and that's why FileMaker works for so many different organizations yeah. you know yeah. I mean we have a lot of smaller to medium-sized clients who would never be able to afford all of the different environments huh. and right depends like on that. The risk. So it, okay. yeah it, it depends I mean some of it they're not that expensive I mean when you look at a dev server and a staging server in the cloud, you're talking about a, a few hundred dollars a year, really, you know, maybe a thousand or two thousand dollars. And if it really is that small of a client, um, it's probably not a big deal for them. If, if you know, two thousand dollars a year for having a dev server in the cloud somewhere is something where it's like, oh, I really can't afford that, then the FileMaker system that you're creating for them probably isn't that important for them where they're not going to lose a lot of revenue if it goes down or if a mistake is made. Um, and that's really the, you know, that's the conversation that you have with the client where you say, you know, if something bad were to happen, you know, what would happen to your business? Yeah. You know, if you were to lose a day of productivity, if everybody was just like, well, systems down, we can't do anything. How much does that actually cost? And for some people it's like, well, you know, they have other things to do. It's fine. And other people are like, Oh, yeah, if we idle 100 people for an entire day, that's tens of thousands of dollars that they lost. Mm -hmm. And then once you put it in those terms, it's like, oh, yeah, we really, you know, having that happen would be really bad. And maybe I can't afford some insurance against that by spending a couple thousand dollars on, on this type of environment. So it really is about, you know, what is the client's tolerance for that type of an event when you're doing sort of live development in in and they're unable to sort of invest that into making sure that their systems are operational. They have to make that decision and they have to understand what the ramifications are of each choice that they make there. And sometimes, yeah, it's like, well, you know, this is a little tool just to make somebody else's life easier. Then great, you know, live development is probably perfectly fine for them. But if it's like, oh, we're gonna lose thousands of dollars or we might lose customers, if the system goes down for any length of time, then you might want to invest in something that will help prevent that from happening. Yeah, I mean, it's all good points. I, I don't disagree. I just know that there are a lot of different scenarios out there and, and there's not a one size fits all solution. But the other thing I would ask about is, you know, how do you successfully test? We have a lot of clients who their databases are 40 gigabyte files. And you can't test that with a hundred records and have a right. realistic experience when you're testing to see what, what, what your performance yeah. is. Going to be. What, what kind of testing are you talking about? Um, performance testing or sort of unit and testing? Anything, anything, you know, even okay. just if, if you okay. develop a file locally and you're, you know, going to different screens, running reports, whatever you're doing, and then you pop it on the yeah. server your behavior, your experience can change. Your, your performance yep. can get slower. You know, it, it's just a different <laughs> experience. So I'm only pointing out the fact that there are 
a million variables to consider. So every right. situation has to be looked at in that context. You know, you know, I, I laugh because I remember at a previous company with a, a previous boss, one of the arguments that he had for all of us developers having computers that were like five years old was that if we developed on these really old computers, then if it was too slow for us, then it was going to be too slow for the for the client. Meanwhile, he could have like the latest, most high end, fastest computer because he was, you know, the CEO or whatever, but everybody else had to have these old clunkers. I didn't really buy that argument at the time. Um, and I and I still don't buy it. I do think that when you're talking, you know, we're talking about two different types of testing. So one is sort of unit and integration testing, which is, did we break anything when we made this update to the system? And with my education software, that was a hard question to answer because everything was so tightly coupled that if I changed something, I had to rely on my own memory to make sure that I knew all of the things that might be affected by it. And because I was a very cautious developer, what often happened is I would just create a new version of that script. And I'd be like, well, the old version still is doing what the old version did. I'll, I'll mark it as deprecated. I'll create this new version. That's hard to do. Um, FileMaker doesn't have versioning internally. It doesn't have great script management. You know, we have folders. That's about it. And so that's difficult to do. Now, things like FM perception um, and FM comparison make that easier now. I didn't have those back then. But it was difficult to, to do that, but I was really, really worried about breaking something when I made a change. Now what I can do in terms of testing functionality is I can create a unit test for that. So all of my APIs, and AP, you know the way I talk about APIs, they're just scripts that are for public consumption. If you ever look at anything, any of our free utilities we download, they're just what's public. Like you can rely on this script. If you send it this stuff, you're going to get back this result. That's all the API is. It's a way for you to rely on the functionality of the system without, you know, and I can change the internals. I can change the way the scripts work internally, but as long as the, the parameters you give it and the result you get back are the same, then, then that's what we guarantee. So we write automated testing for all of that to make sure that every time that we make a change, we run all of those tests and, it, and make sure that we send it a, a parameter, we get back the expected result. In terms of performance, that's a little bit trickier um, because you have things like load and we can simulate those things, but that becomes really difficult to do. You know, so if you're testing a system and, and, and there are tools out there, I think, I think Saliant has a tool for doing benchmarking of, of systems and things like that. But it's really difficult like to take your specific solution that you've developed and test to see if it's like, well, how is this change that I made? How's that going to impact performance? Because I'm not necessarily able in testing to simulate 150 users hitting it. And that really is, I think for us, it's really just about you push it to, to production sometimes. And then if you hear the user scream, you can roll back. Like that's, that's one of the great features of auto is that like, if you push something out and it just, it, and something horribly goes wrong, you just roll back that deployment, you know, maybe you have to do a little something like if there was some data entry that you have to, you know, make sure that you re reclaim, but, but that type of thing, it's, it's really about feel. It's like, well, and again, if your design is loosely coupled, you really don't run into that that often because what you're talking about is, you know, I've written my scripts this way, my data is modeled this way, I'm not doing a lot of heavy stuff on the graph. So the, the typical performance bottlenecks in the system, you've designed around those anyway. And so then it just becomes a question of, like, is everything actually working the way that we expect it to work? I think you can also, you know, a lot of us have or, or have had legacy systems that are tightly coupled and very heavy and have big files, all the things, right? I'm sure we've all have all the kinds of stories we can tell around the campfire about that. But I think that it's okay to start building decoupled things in a coupled system, right? So like a new thing comes up, I'm gonna build it separately, right? And, and I think that is like, I have had this internal turmoil before as a developer, right? It's like, 
is that okay? Like, shouldn't I just do what the rest of the system does? And it's, it feels weird, right? Because you just want to follow the standards so you don't have to, so that you're just following the rules. But I could just do it this better way. <laughs> and then it'll be easier moving forward, right? And I can start taking out certain pieces and I can, I can evolve it so that it starts growing into something that that's more modern. So I think, I think that was a, a, a hard thing for me to accept, but seeing it in action and seeing things happen that way is actually very refreshing. And, and it feels better because you're not <laughs> stuck in the system, right? You're like, oh, I like this little flower I made over here and I'd like to work, you know, and then you start kind of thinking of other places where you could start doing that. So I think that's a scary place. And I, I, and I feel that one deeply actually just from my past as a developer, but um, but I think things are, you know, I think we have, I give everyone the ability <laughs> to start doing that on their legacy systems. <laughs> I, I dawn on you this freedom. <laughs> Actually, that's a technique that we use sometimes too, if we have, and we have a lot of legacy systems. So a lot of what I'm hearing sounds wonderful. And we do many of these things and we want to get there with net new stuff, but we have a ton of legacy systems, but what we have I have done a lot is when someone needs something new, I do build, you know, maybe it's a new file that connects to their system or, um, you know, just a different way of doing things. And that also helps them see what's possible. You know, it may not look exactly like everything else because it doesn't have to, you know, here's what a card window looks like. Yes. We have people who don't know what a card window looks like and, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So yeah, now totally. we, can, we can start rebuilding your system. Um, that's so, when developers turn into salespeople, right? Like exactly. Hey, did you see this really beautiful card window <laughs> over here? Like check right. it out. <laughs> right. So yeah, again, it's just back to there's, there's no one way to do it in the FileMaker um, world. I have, because... a I have a couple of thoughts, Beth. What, what you also mentioned is specifically to the performance. Um, that's kind of where a staging server comes in because mm -hmm. the staging server can be where you have production data pulled in and then the dev file migrated on top of it. So now you have production <laughs> before it goes to production. Yeah, a more realistic uh, test environment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you, so you can... Um, if this is allowed, given the data protections that might be required for certain clients, but if it's allowed for someone to look at production data uh, in this type of an environment, that's where you could look at how this all works. And then the second thought I had was squash the unstored calcs <laughs> and set them in <laughs> scripts transactionally. Oh yeah, I, I rarely use an unstored yeah. calc. Oh, just, just I, another I, whole you know, approach. Yeah. Yeah. to to it and um you know corn would take that up 10 levels to it's just a <laughs> json object somewhere yeah. and, uh, you know <laughs> kill, kill the summary fields as well kill, this, kill it all, kill all the tables kill, all i the have tables. an old brain one, but i try to teach it new tricks <laughs> but yeah so staging allows you to see how it will play out mm -hmm. um and the other thing <laughs> is small incremental improvements pushed to production, small incremental improvements. I mean, yep. like to practice yep. what I preach, so Martha's going to keep me honest on this, but ideally you have very little in dev before you push it to production. So the changes are not substantial when you I do think, that rollout. Yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I came... <laughs> I came and like to, to learning about auto and being terrified of it because I hadn't seen it work. And that was not my experience with, with deployments in the past. And I was very resistant to this, like not working in production that we could actually work in like quick cycles. And Barbara is keeping, I will keep her honest in that she does do that. Like things will get pushed every night. Sometimes she's like, yeah, I'll just refresh production. It's like, I'll make a change and then push it to production. Um, and I am, I, I, the thing that I experienced as a developer was I tried to build a lot before I pushed to production. If I did have, if I was lucky enough to have a dev server, because doing a migration was so much work. I mean, mm -hmm. it was hours yeah. and it was at 8 PM, right. That it started. Okay. And yeah. then that was Friday. And then Saturday I had to make sure it was working. And then Sunday I prayed that it was working and then Monday I like couldn't breathe right I mean I, I joke about it but like it, it was a lot of stress right and even if I wasn't doing the dev my developer was stressed or whoever um mm -hmm. and so I I hated the idea of pushing that often 
And then I was thinking like, that's a lot of money I'm charging my client for something that feels that I'm not even, I'm not even like delivering the feature, right? I'm just pushing that feature. Yeah. And so I, I have to admit that I was really impressed at, at auto removes that friction, right? And so and it's not about the automating it so much as like you push a button and you can just do those things. And so having a tool that actually removes some of that, some of that, both cost on like not great dev time in my mind, right? Like I would rather spend those hours on something that's going to benefit the bigger. Um, but I was, I for sure was terrified of this, <laughs> get a, <laughs> get a dev server and push to production. And what did that mean? And what if it all broke? I mean, it, it was a hard transition for me, but I'm, I'm glad Barbara <laughs> was there to hold my hand <laughs> and prove that it worked. <laughs> so, so, it, so in my mind, so it's in my mind, the cost change. Yeah. yeah, and in my mind, the cost of all that dev time that I used to spend now goes to the, you know, a dev server plus auto or or whatever tool you're going to use. But like having those in place saves you money in other places and sanity and minimizes risk. <laughs> so again, it's a hard conversation to have sometimes. Yeah. I, I don't want. I don't. Beth, I don't want to pretend like it's the oh everyone should be doing this. Obviously, kind of <laughs> mentality. Not. It's not that at all. Um, but it is nice when that is. Once you, yeah, it's a nice thing to have <laughs> when you can make it work. You know, I've, I've heard some people say, well, that's a competitive advantage of FileMaker. You can d develop in production, you know, and they instantly get their change. <laughs> um, I have a um, short list of things that I will do in production. I call it hot fixes. Um, I guess I, I trust myself to know this is not a huge change. This is not affecting data. This is you know, not a big thing. I mean, and then we know right, what that, that little list is, right. right? I don't feel like I'm adding, mm -hmm. um, but maybe I'm deluding myself a bit, but, but little things. I'm certainly like, you know, move a label over here. The, the, the field's not wide enough. I'm seeing a question mark. All of those okay. little things, right. I'll do that in production, then immediately go do it in dev. Right. You gotta remember. They don't you push dev and um, wipe out your change, right. yeah. So, so I, 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 I do sometimes work in production. I'm not going to say I'm, I'm a purist because there are certain things that I'll use the FileMaker advantage of. I can just go in and do this for you. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are dangers there. There are dangers that people don't think about. Um, yeah. which, which is, so what's happening, what happens when you modify a layout when somebody has a record open that they're actively editing? Oops. Or you know, let's say that layout has a has a tab control. Oh, that, and they're modifying the fields on. The yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, there's all of these things, and and if your scripts are written, and if you've ever looked at any of my scripts, they're all just error checking. Like I would say, like eighty percent of the script is error control blocks. Yes. Because I'm worried about. Like there's so many things that can cause an error. And if you're doing live development and you're not doing error checking like that, and you're not trapping for those errors and checking for them actively, you can, you can mess up data with what seems like it's not even a data change. It's not you're like, oh, I'm just doing this here. Yeah, yeah. But all of a sudden you've locked a table or you've locked a layout or you've locked all the records and your script is just blithely going on and on doing stuff. And the next thing you know, you've, you've really messed up the data and it was, just right, my list just got doing. shorter, Corn. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, it's funny because... But that's the thing, is that it's, yeah. you're lucky if you know what went wrong. It's even more, the, the, yeah. the, the known knowns or whatever. That's the thing that yep. scared me, where Todd said, yeah, and what if you didn't know that you just had problems? What if you didn't know right? for months? <laughs> I'm like, oh, God! <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's funny. But so um okay. And who knows what's coming, right, Corn? In the modern <laughs> FileMaker revolution, who knows what's coming? You had said we were focused on FileMaker I... and server right now, but there's a lot more coming. Yep. Yeah. Studio's coming. That'll be very exciting. Okay. See what we can how we can utilize that. Um yeah. you know, one of the things with Studio is that it is cloud first and cloud only. So, you know, for everybody who is sort of wedded to on-prem, this is going to be a different environment for them. And they're going to have to mm. figure out how are they actually going to work in that type of environment. Or, or it's going so, to be a while. <laughs> but they, the plans are there, but don't hold your breath. Yeah. 
I, I, I'm certainly not going to hold my breath. <laughs> maybe it comes in a year. Maybe it comes in two years. Maybe it comes in five years. I don't know. Peter refuses to answer that question. He just says that they would like to do it at some point, which is about as noncommittal as you can get without saying no. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know. We've actually gone over time, but clock? I'm happy to. That's what I was just going to say. We're about an hour and 45, but we've been having some good conversations. Okay. So I don't want to cut it short, but I also want to be respectful of everybody's as well. I'm happy to stick around for more time if other people want to continue. Um, otherwise, I think this has been a great conversation. I've been really glad that Ernest got sick so that I could <laughs> sort of lead this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I shouldn't say it like that. Don't, don't tell him I said that way. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's been great. Yeah, I uh, have a very early morning meeting, so I am going to bow out at this point. But it's excellent discussion, Todd. Thanks for having them on and Corn being able to contribute and Martha and Barbara from the company also putting in stuff. Thank you very much. I'm going to head off to Beverly. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, Martha. All right, I know we've gone over on time, but I definitely want to get into the announcements here, at least briefly. Uh, there is a special Claris Update webinar, which is tomorrow, Thursday, September 8th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, you'll get a chance to hear from uh, Brad Freitag, Peter Nelson, and Robert Holsey about the current status of the Claris platform and all the good stuff that they're working on. Second announcement is there are some new software updates available for Claris FileMaker 19, uh, which is 19.5.3. Uh, you can see we've got some updates to OpenSSL. It addresses an issue where files could not be reopened after modifying the settings, uh, but you can check out the release notes for the complete details. We are quickly approaching the deadline, uh, but registration for Pause on Error 2022 is open until September 12th. So if you'd like to meet with some like-minded people in the hills of northern Georgia, you can sign up to do just that. And our last announcement is just some shameless self-promotion as Cross IT serves another one of our FileMaker Lunch and Learn webinars. Uh, that'll be on September 21st at 12 p.m. And you'll get to hear Todd talk about the utility scripts that he routinely adds to his solutions. Moving on to the survey results, we asked when working with the FileMaker platform, where do you feel you have the most proficiency or have the most knowledge? And everybody was uh, spread around a little bit, but clustered around the uh, defining database, building layouts, working with calculations, or writing scripts. The second question was the flip side of the coin, where we asked when working with the FileMaker platform, where do you feel the need to improve your skill level the most? And the overwhelming majority said it was when integrating with external data sources. And our final question was, which of these Kennywood roller coasters do you enjoy riding? And the majority uh, selected the classic wooden coasters that you find at Kennywood, which are the Jackrabbit, the Racer, and the Thunderbolt. All right, so on to the important dates. Uh, so our next meeting is October 12th. Uh, this is a departure from our normal meeting schedule. Uh, due to a scheduling conflict, we are unable to meet on the first Wednesday of the month, so we will be meeting on the second Wednesday of the month. Uh, again, just a reminder, pause on error is coming up on October 24th to the 27th. And the final important date is that the Star Wars and or series debuts on Disney Plus September 21st. Speaking of next month's topic, uh, Beth Lada from IT Solutions and Todd Weller from Cross IT will be here to talk about Claris Studio. Uh, they've both been able to enjoy access to the developer preview and are going to share some of their insight and knowledge as they build a solution uh, right before our very eyes. And as we close, let me just offer another special thank you to Corn Walker of Proofgeist. Uh, for jumping in and filling in for Ernest, who was under the weather and unable to join us. Uh, so thank you, Corn, and also everyone at Proofgeist who helped to organize and make this meeting possible. Uh, thank you, of course, for joining us, and also thank you to Profile F Developers for letting us use their Zoom meeting space. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time.